Hi Megan, hi Claire. Hi Darcy. Hi Margaret. How's everyone doing on this beautiful Friday evening? Hi Ian. I'm in the conservatory here at home and I have to say it's absolutely roasting hot. Um, but I'm absolutely not complaining. It's a beautiful evening. Hi Izzy, how are we doing? Hope everyone's well. I just wanted to uh, to start off with, before we uh, kick off with, with the live session with, with this evening's guest, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank everybody once again uh, for the ongoing support that you're giving to um, A Stroke of Luck. It's incredibly uh, appreciated. Uh, we love having people sharing our posts and providing us uh, with the feedback that we're receiving. So yeah, thank you. And um, we, we, we hope that you, you continue to share. Regarding the live sessions we've now run, um, I think this is the, the fifth week that we've done the lives. Um, we've been getting some, some great comments, some lovely emails in. Um, we've been getting some fantastic uh, DMs as well. So just wondered, any of you that are on now, whether you've got any feedback uh, from the lives that you've watched that A Stroke of Luck has done with, with the guests that we've had. I'm absolutely certain tonight's guest is going to be going to be incredible, um, and I can't wait to have a have a chat with her. Incredibly inspirational lady, and I see she's already joined, so I'm excited to to bring her in. We'll just wait another couple of minutes or so, uh, just see if anybody else is running a couple of minutes late and wants to and wants to join us on this session. So, those of you that are watching at the moment, is everyone well? Has everyone had a good week? I hope it's as warm where you are as it is as it is here. It's absolutely gorgeous. So Margaret's watching in Saudi Arabia. Okay, uh, Margaret, I'm absolutely certain that it's warmer where you are uh, than where I am. So Mega's had an energetic week. That doesn't surprise me, Meg, and I'm sure we're going to find out a little bit more uh, in a second or two. Um, hi, Nick. Hi, John. Hope, hope everyone's doing well. What temperature is it over there in Saudi Arabia, Margaret? Because I think it's probably just low to mid 20s here, which for, for a lad with the skin uh, palette that I've got, it's still, it's still more than warm enough. Hi, Steve. Wow, 107 degrees today in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I'm not too sure that I would cope too well in, in that level of heat. Um, it's, that's, that's pretty extreme. That really is extreme. Okay, so as I mentioned, we, we've received some, some fantastic feedback from the lives that we've done last week. And last week's one with Michael Liner um, went really well. Uh, and the feedback we got from, from Michael was, was great, as well as those that, that joined us. Um, so just to introduce this week's live guest, uh, I'm incredibly exciting to, 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 to be having a conversation uh, with Megan. Megan's a stroke survivor. Not only is she a stroke survivor, she's a gold medal winning Paralympic cyclist. And that's pretty phenomenal. In fact, it's incredibly phenomenal. So I can't wait to talk to her about her cycling achievements. Well, I want to chat to Megan uh, about uh, life before stroke, uh, uh, to Megan about kind of what it's like to be a cyclist and, and what it's like on the, on the world stage. And then also how Megan deals with um, kind of her mental well-being as well. Uh, so, so that's going to be the theme of, of today's discussion. But before I invite Megan into this, I just wanted to let you know that the work that uh, we're doing is gaining great traction and great momentum, which we're dead excited about. 
Uh, and we're fortunate to have guests like Megan, like Michael, uh, like Chris from the Stroke Association, like our experts, and the very first that we did on our birthday, Ian, our, um, our founding trustee. It's brilliant that we've got these guests joining us. We are such a young charity that we are not eligible for, for government grants. So we rely purely on the kindness of donations from individuals. So if you're feeling generous at the end of this live session, please just hit the, hit the link in our bio, click the donate button and pennies and pounds all mount up. So anything that you can afford would be greatly appreciated by us as a, as a very young charity. Okay, so without any further ado, I'm going to be asking and inviting Megan to join me now on the live. Uh, bear with me, here we go. Megan and... Here we go. Is it going to work? Is it going to work? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There How she you is. <laughs> Magic, hey. it works. How are you doing? <laughs> not too bad, thanks. Not too bad. Good. Are you, are you warm where you are? are You're in Manchester, right? Oh, now, it, is, it is roasting. Not as hot as Saudi Arabia by <laughs> any means, but I am not complaining. <laughs> nice. No, beautiful. What's it like going out on your bike in this weather? Is it good? Oh, it is amazing. The moment you have sun, you, you lap it up. Yeah. You know, we, do, we are very fortunate to have the sun and the weather in the current climates that we're, we're living in at the moment. So I'm using it as often as I can, as I am bored of the rain. And I <laughs> am not going to be doing a rain dance anytime soon either. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's it with the sport like cycling, Megan. The amount of miles you have to put into your legs uh, as an athlete at your level. Unfortunately, Britain isn't always the nicest climate to be a cyclist in. Um, so you've had to put up with terrible conditions, I'd imagine, year after year after year. So no wonder you're lapping up the good weather at the moment as part of your training regime. Definitely, definitely. Okay, well, thanks, thanks ever so much for, for joining me uh, and a stroke of luck on this. The one thing, I, before I start asking you any questions, the one thing you know, I want to say to everybody watching, I'm incredibly proud um, that you're actually an ambassador of our charity. To have somebody like you... Megan, that supporting us as a very young charity is incredible. So I wanted to take the opportunity firstly to thank you very much for joining us on the line and to say thank you ever so much for being an ambassador to A Stroke of Luck as well. Oh, you don't need to thank me. I, I just, I love these kind of initiatives and anything where I can play my part and assist in any way, I'm always going to be there. Well, no, thank you. And it, it, that comes from me, that comes from everyone at A Stroke of Luck, but absolutely to, to other stroke survivors like you and I, you know, having someone as inspirational as you, um, kind of promoting your message and promoting activity after stroke can only be a benefit to other stroke survivors. So, so kind of well done and, and thank you very much. But I'm now going to give you a grinning <laughs> and uh, we're, going to, we're going to have a good time listening to the answers to your questions. So if, okay, it's, all, well, if it's all right, I want to start uh, with kind of your life pre-stroke, Megan. So my understanding is you were a multi-sports coach um, and then in 2013, you had your stroke. So we'll, we'll deal with 2013 and kind of the events after it in a second. But what was life like for you before before 2013? So before 2013, I always class myself as Megan the First. Yeah. Um, and I was a multi-sports coach, but I'd also worked uh, in a school sports partnership. Um, I'd worked in education. I'd worked in the care sector. I'd worked as a kennel manager. I'd worked as a in, in the police force. I'd oh, done right. a variety of different jobs. I was a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, I just wanted to always better myself and always learn from my life experiences. I came from a bit of an underprivileged background, and I didn't want to end up like my parents. My parents are drinkers. Um, they, they've struggled in life. Um, I don't have anything to do with my biological father, things like that. So there's, there's, there's tough spots there. But I always knew that I wanted to do better and I wanted to be different to my family. So yeah. if they drank, I didn't drink. If they smoked, I didn't smoke. If they liked sports, I probably wouldn't have liked sports. But because they don't like sports, I love sports. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So yeah, I was a bit of a, um, in a weird kind of way, I, I've... Um, yeah i've just i've carved out my my own my own journey really and i've tried to make everything by myself as independently yeah. as possible up until 2013. okay so 
leading up to to the day in which you had your stroke, you were a multi sports coach. What what happened on that day? Ha, ha, what was the experience like for you? Because I know every stroke's different and it's unique, and people experience better, a wide ranging uh, set of you know events that lead and conspire to having a stroke. But what what was it like for you? It's uh, it's a funny one actually because I was sitting at the desk at a desk and um, doing some paperwork. Um, and I got a phone call from my mum and it was actually a couple of days before I was diagnosed and she'd said that my nana passed away and she passed away from multiple um, aneurysms in the brain but she was an older lady so she was right. in her 90s quite easily. I couldn't tell you exactly how old she was because I cannot remember. Um, I do blame the brain injury for that one um, but she told me about that and within a couple of days I was having really chronic headaches and I had I had been having headaches to be fair for a couple of months um, yeah. and my moods were changing my my character was changing and I had a really stiff neck and right. I woke up one morning and and I had a bloodshot eye and it wasn't the usual bloodshot eye where it's a little one and it just goes away it, <laughs> it, she's a puppy dog um, it continues to grow bigger and bigger and I ended up with my whole eye bright red right um, and someone said to me, you should go and have that looked at. But before I had it looked at, I actually fainted at work at the desk. Um, and to be fair, I really generally thought I was going to go into hospital or go to the doctors and I was going to walk out with migraines or something. So yeah. I felt a bit like a high contract going. So I left it until my day off. Because also, money, work is money. And money is important in life nowadays. Everyone wants a bit of money. Um, everyone wants your money. So I would rather have waited for my day off than actually lose a day's work. So I walked in Twainy, and at the time I was in Warwickshire, and I went up to the reception, and I said to the, I said, look, I, I, I don't know whether there's anything wrong, but I'm having really bad headaches, and I've got a bloodshot eye, and I just need just to check it over, really, just to satisfy my own head, really, and everyone else around me. Yeah. And I was looking around, and in A&E, you know, normally they're very, very obvious what's wrong with people. You know, they're sitting there holding their arm. They've got a broken arm. There was a child, I think, with a bloody nose and bits like that. But mine, you couldn't see. I was just, I walked in. I just had a headache, but I was able to walk and talk and everything else. I thought nothing of it. Yeah. Anyway, I went through the triage process and they asked me the questions and the pain and rate the pain, etc. And that was it, really. I was like, okay, I'm going to be sent away. And they said, look, we're, we're we reckon it's cluster headaches, a bit of tension maybe um, going on in your life. And um, yeah, we're going to give you some medication and send you on your way. But what I hadn't noticed is the, at the time, the A&E was absolutely chock a block and that's standard, isn't it, nowadays? It is, but, yeah. uh, and I went in, there wasn't a bed and they wanted to just get me out of the way. So they, lay, um, they gave me this bed. But what I noticed, so I was lying down, I was looking up at the ceiling and I realised I was actually in a... Um, because they run out of beds. I was actually in like an operating theatre. Um, all the lights were dimmed down and everything. But I was actually in an operating theatre lying on a bed and thought nothing of it at the time. Wow. And the, a woman at, walked in and, and realised I was there and goes, oh, I'm sorry. Um, may I ask why you're here? So I told, explained the situation. She asked me my signs and symptoms. And she said, look, I'm just going to go away and speak to the doctor. I'll be back. Little did I know she was a neurologist. Right. And she basically just wanted them to look into it because she didn't think... My, it added up my age yeah I was 27 at the time so I was relatively young now we all know now now I've had a stroke anyway I know now that stroke can happen to anyone from the moment they're in the womb yeah um and it's amazing how much you suddenly learn and the amount of people you realize it affects yeah. once you've actually suffered from from something like that absolutely and so yeah so I got put in a post and I was actually in A&E for about four days in total so they CT scanned me and it came back clear and once again the doctor was like I think we're going to send you away with cluster headaches but if it continues return back um but they kept coming around doing checks and they, by this time obviously you don't stay in A&E for four days they move you on to a ward I was on a ward and I was the youngest one there and everyone else what literally looked sick they looked like they were dying yeah and I was like I really don't want to be here I want to be was out I'm, I'm losing my head. I was in denial. I generally thought they were going to send me away with headaches and that I was absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, so I thought nothing of it. Anyway, they then said, just to be on the safe side, we're going to do a lumbar puncture. So for most people who have had strokes, they probably had this or know of it. Um, for anyone that's listening that hasn't had one, then you may want to block your ears. It's up to you. But basically, they lie you in fetal position on your side. They, uh, they, open, they 
select a certain part within the spine and they basically put a needle straight in between those two vertebrae and they draw out some fluid and to be fair it didn't i didn't feel a thing and they did said this may be uncomfortable and i was like no it's fine it's absolutely fine mind you i like to think i'm the rock sometimes you must be and, um, <laughs> so uh they did that they went away and then they came back and said, we just want to do a dyed CT scan just to make sure. So they injected some dye into me, put me obviously through the CT scan machine again. Um, and you may well have had this actually, but obviously it makes you feel like you're peeing yourself and you, when you, do, you don't think it's going to do anything to you. Like, no, it's not going to do anything. There's massive heat rise through your body and then you stand up, expect to see something dripping down your leg. And you're like, oh, this is magic. <laughs> so yeah had that as well um and by the end of that and after i'd used up all the hospital resources and money um this really well-dressed suited and booted doctor came over to me i hadn't seen him before he was behind the scenes glasses tie i remember that shirt and um trousers and he came over and i thought oh this this looks ominous and he came over and he said look i'm i'm really sorry i haven't told you earlier i didn't want to cause any um disruption or stress you out too too soon but basically this is what's wrong with you and he gave me this mountain of paperwork to read through and said look have a read of this but he did explain it first but he did yeah. give me this paperwork i didn't read the paperwork i won't lie i i had no idea what i was reading i was yeah. like no i'd rather not know for the moment um so he basically i had a sub acne with brain hemorrhage and yeah basically they said you have two options we don't have a neurosurgeon on site you will need an operation or some form of surgery but we don't know what that is at this moment in time. So you have two options. You can either fly to Cambridge Hospital in one direction. Bear in mind, I'm in Warwickshire, A&E. Yeah. Or you can be jetted off up, up the motorway, blues and twos, um, to Birmingham, Queen Elizabeth. I chose Birmingham. But my biggest reason for choosing Birmingham was because if I'd flown in the hel helicopter, I would not have seen the, um, I would not have seen the view. I would have been laying there just waiting to get there. So I was like, no, I'm not doing that. It's all right, I'll go flight. to the... <laughs> Yeah, completely. I was like, you can save that for another day when I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was that. So I ended up at Birmingham with Queen Elizabeth. And when I got there, sorry, adjust my glasses, don't like where it's sitting. When I got there, um, I had another surgeon come and sit down with me and he said, right, this is the situation. And he drew this picture of what my aneurysm looked like. He said, this is our options and this is what we're going to try and do. And basically, what he'd drawn was a floppy willy sitting inside my head. That was exactly what I had. So I was like, that's very deflated, isn't it? <laughs> I was not impressed with having that sitting in my head. So I said, right, so what are we going to do about this then? <laughs> so his option was, but basically, I had no option. I had to go go and have a procedure. <laughs> right. So I had no choice in the matter. So the aim was is that it was going to be a three-hour procedure, roughly, and they were wow. going to coil. And coiling is basically they go up through your groin, so right up into your, your never regions, that area. Yeah. Um, also, obviously, I'm out cold, so, or I was out cold. Anyway, I have heard people's stories where they've been awake for it, and that sounds horrendous. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be awake. Not for me. Um, and, yeah, so they basically, they went up, bypassed the heart, they got up to the brain, they released some tiny little springs into right. where that site is to try and stop the bleeding and allow you just allow it to heal over. Um, I got woken up mid-surgery or mid-procedure at this time, because that's classed as a procedure. And they basically, I do remember this, because they tried to get me to sign paperwork, and I couldn't understand what I was doing or why I was doing it, but I got a piece of paperwork with my squiggle all over it. And you could see that I was basically, I didn't know what I was signing. I was out cold. But it's yeah. because I didn't have a neck pin available to sign on my behalf. Yeah. Um, so this is what I needed. Um, and basically they explained not that I remember this, I obviously only remember it once I came through, is that they had to cut me open, effectively, with a knife and fork. Uh, maybe not a knife and fork, maybe a bit bit posher, a bit shinier, a bit cleaner. Um, and they opened me up. So, a bit of a face-off job. Um, so, I've got a nice big scar from here, down to here. Um, and a bit of, I've got a bit of skull that's obviously been removed and replaced with uh, whatever it is. I don't really know the technical terms for it. I yeah. really should look into it a little bit more, I guess. But um, yeah, I was in, I was in surgery about 13 hours in total. Wow. Um, and when I came through, it was about three weeks later. I did, wasn't aware of the timing, but I was put straight into ICU yeah. um, to allow the body to rest. And I was in, um, I think I was put into a coma as such. But while I was there, I remember every so often drifting in and out and hearing voices and hearing doctors and people speak. And I could hear them saying things about me. 
Yeah. And I could see the people around me but couldn't understand why I was where I was. Yeah. I couldn't understand why um, I couldn't sit up, but the person next to me could at the time. And they had this person sitting up and they were making him cough. And that's the one thing I remember in ICU terribly is that every, I don't, it felt like it was every 10 minutes, but I'm sure it's probably every couple of hours or so. They um, would basically remove or lift the pipe, um, the arm of piping that was down my throat because my lungs kept collapsing to help it clear. Wow. And I kept, they kept the armor piping in me, which normally they don't do, but there was some, something medically had gone wrong with, I don't know, the way my brain was functioning, it obviously wasn't firing up my breathing correctly. Yeah. And I was in there for about three weeks out cold, so they couldn't assess me fully, but I could hear them saying things like, I don't think she's going to be able to talk. We don't know what her physical reaction is going to be like because she's not, not capable yet. Yeah. Um, when I did eventually come round, I was adamant I'd been to the toilet, I'd done this, I'd done that. And I, there's no way I could have. I had lost my right side. I had memory issues. I had confabulation, which is basically false memories put into my head. Um, I say put into my head. It's basically where there's a blank spot in the brain where something's gone missing. It kind of like puts something in there. Right. So basically things that I've seen on films or things like that, or memories that I have of other people telling me stuff, it's gone into my head. And even now, sometimes I have to correct myself because I go and say something and generally believe that's happened to me. And then when I look back, I realise it wasn't me at all. It was someone else's wow. story I was telling. Wow. <laughs> so sometimes I'm a liar without meaning to be. <laughs> yeah, no, that's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it's, 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 it is a very odd situation. So when I woke up, I remember asking for my brother's now I've actually got three sisters uh yep, three sisters, one brother. But I was asking for two brothers that never existed, Harry and Alfie. One had blonde type um tight blonde curls, um, and he was in super smart jeans and a check shirt, and then the other one was in sports gear, dark, short brown hair. And they are real to me. And when I was told that they didn't exist, never existed, I almost had to grieve them a bit like I was grieving my own body and my own life because to me they were real it was a really surreal thing and and trying to explain that to someone is yeah. extremely hard <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. that's incredible and so but but you're very very recognizant now though that at the time you thought they're real but now you realize they weren't or do you still have a memory that you believe they're real or they the only reason you know that they're not is because you've been told they're not the only reason I know they're not is because I've been told they're not. So wow. in, in my head, I've got, I've still got live memories of them. And actually they're more real than the memories I have of my actual brother half the time. So it's um, really hard. And also when you have uh, memory issues, yeah. you, you have to run on other people's memories, which is their memories anyway, but they're telling you about your life. Yeah. So, because everyone's memory is different yeah. of something. Yeah. And if I, if, I, if I was to speak to my wife or my son about a memory from maybe a few weeks back, we'd all have a different intake on what, what happened that day. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. and I would love that I'm right, but I know that chances are my brain will fail me. <laughs> well, so, so you've gone through an incredibly traumatic experience in 2013 to the point where, as you say, you know, your, your, your brain is conjuring memories for you that aren't that aren't real so that that must be a very very difficult thing for you to deal with and you said pre that you'd had um uh, an upbringing that had challenges um so so yeah from a mental welfare perspective um you you, you must be incredibly resilient as a character so let, let's move on from 2013 where you've gone through this situation you've been told that um you know you, you've got a problem now with your brain you've gone through surgery you've had the procedure what what went through your mind, Megan, to think, right, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to now go out on a bike. And how did you then go through, I'm going to go out on a bike to support my recovery, to then wearing a British tracksuit, competing in Rio in 2016, and standing on the top of the podium, listening to God Save the Queen as a gold medalist, Paralympic cyclist. How did that happen? Because that is just remarkable. Well, first and foremost, I, I don't even know the words to God save the Queen. I was mumbling it while my competitors who were standing either side of me sang it for me. I was like, this will work fine, I'll just mime. <laughs> I had no idea what I was singing. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> but, um, so when I came home, so I actually self-discharged two months after my operation right. against the doctor's advice because I didn't like being in hospital. I, I generally felt like I was being held back and I didn't like 
always being felt like I was a child and not given choice. You know, yeah. as an adult, you, you, know, you work hard to get to a place and then you don't want to revert backwards and be treated like a child. And not every, don't get me wrong, not everyone was like that. There were some amazingly supportive people there. But when you clash with someone and you've been through something so hard, it's really hard to gain respect or have respect for someone that doesn't empathise with you or allow you to try. Yeah. And I am an incredibly independent, stubborn person when I want to be. And I will, you know, if I believe in something so much or it's testing my values and morals, I'm going to fight it all the way. And so I went home and that very first day, I remember sitting in the corner of the house all by myself, hands over my head and just crying because I suddenly realised what I couldn't do. In hospital, I was the strongest person there. And then I go home and I am the weakest person. You know, I... I I suddenly realised that if I went into a shop, people would look at me funny because I couldn't necessarily speak properly. Um, my right side didn't work. I couldn't get access to toilets, yep. um, things like that, little things like that. And I found myself having to explain myself all the time because people thought I was drunk and, or I felt like people thought I was drunk. Yeah. And, and I'd lost everything. You know, I didn't have any family around me. I, um, ha all my dogs had to be given up. I had five dogs at the time. Five dogs. I remember three vividly, and then there's two. I remember, but I don't know actually. That might be a, see. That might be a false memory. I know there's definitely three, so we'll go for three. Three dogs um, that I had to give up, and they went. Fortunately, when I used to work as a kennel manager and worked in kennels, my um, boss there, Mrs. C, I call her. She took the dogs in. I looked after them to start off with, in the hope that I could recover quite quickly. And when we realised it was going to be far too long and I couldn't do it. I said, could you help me rehome them? Because it's not fair on them. I don't want them left in kennels. So that's what happened. Um, and then six months after my initial operation and initial diagnosis and everything else going wrong in my life, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. Um, I have three or four different forms of epilepsy that show their, show their face dependent on the day, dependent on the fatigue levels, dependent on my moods, all sorts of things that can affect it. Lighting, um, yeah any kind of sensitivity really and I couldn't cope that was it I was like I just don't know what to do and I rang my friend in Cambridge Hannah I said look can I come and stay with you um, I'm pretty sure I didn't do it so so calmly I'm pretty sure I was a hysterical mess and actually a shadow of myself and I picked up a bike in the in a in like a barn I tied my hand to the handlebar I tied my foot to the pedal and I cycled all the way there and by the time I work, got there, it worked out to be about 120 miles. So I'd taken wow. main roads. I don't know how I survived, I do not know. All I, all I can honestly say I think it is, was my life depended on it. You know, for me, it was I needed to get there. Um, it's all I had. And that was my focus. Exactly. 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 Uh, what Nick's just said. Focus. Absolutely. Yes, that was my focus. So... That's what I focused on. And I, I started off around 10, 11 in the morning. And I got there by two in the morning, I think, the following day. And when I got there, I couldn't walk. My body shut down. My right side had shut off. It didn't want, it didn't want to do anything more. Yeah. And I lay on my friend's sofa, wallowing in self-pity, probably stinking the place out. But remember thinking, I need to help her. You know, I, I didn't, I've never asked for help from anyone. I've always done it for myself. But I, I, need to, I need to, you know, make myself worthwhile if I'm staying here. So I'll, I'll try and potter around, try and do little bits and then go back to sleep on the sofa. And while I was there, I met her mum, Karen, who I did know anyway, but we didn't have, um, didn't see each other regularly. But she gave me a bit of a talking to really. She gave me more of a focus. And she said, look, Megan, don't let people hold you back. Don't let people put you down. Go and find a sport and be the best you can be at it, whatever that looks like. Wow. Now, I was always told that I wouldn't be able to, to, to use my right arm again, and I can use my right arm again. Um, it, yes, it does come and go, but I would rather it come and go than not be able to use it at all. And yep. some people don't have that luxury, that they, their arm is completely almost null and void and non-existent. So for me, I would be doing an injustice if, if I didn't use my arm and didn't use my leg when I could. Because yeah. I have a wheelchair, but I very rarely use it. And more so because I'm so stubborn. And plus, I've got OCD and I don't like it hanging around. It drives me insane. It's a dust collector. So I'm sure I'd help my wife out a little bit if I, um, if I did use it a bit more. For you know, I'm quite fortunate in the setup I have now. <laughs> I have a few <laughs> Brilliant. Um, 
so yeah so she gave me that focus but the reason it really drove me and really made me think made me target um being a cyclist was because she actually had terminal cancer and she didn't have long to live but yet she was still living life she was pushing forwards with life she was moving on with life and she knew that she didn't have long but she was making the most of life and i'm pretty sure no doubt 110 percent behind closed doors she was struggling and had to battle her demons all the time but she did it for her family for her friends and because she appreciated every moment she had yeah. and for me that gave me a massive kick up the backside because i had i had a second chance you know, I survived my operation and yeah, my body wasn't fully intact, but I was alive. I was breathing. So what was I going to do? She gave me this mission. That's what I focused on. And at this time, my family had very little to do with because not because I don't love them, but because they're quite, they can be very negative and it's, it's hard. And when you're in a negative place yourself or a down place, you need to focus on you, get yourself stronger to be able to take on other people's worries. Absolutely. So for the first time in a long time, I actually kind of pushed my family away or distanced myself. I didn't even push them away. I just distanced myself in order to focus on what I needed to do. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I applied to be cycling and lo and behold, I became a cyclist. And don't get me wrong, it wasn't an easy journey, but because I didn't have anything else to worry about other than getting my leg right, getting my head right. And every time I cycled, I was making another small improvement, another achievement. And I was focused on everything I was achieving rather than what I couldn't do. It, yeah. um, it made for an amazing journey, you know, and don't, it, it is horrendous sometimes, even now, I really struggle, you know, I think today has been a nightmare trying to get me up and out the, on the bike. More so because I've had a lot going on today, to be fair. But I have yeah. other days where I'm so down, I just really struggle. And it isn't necessary, it can, I can be absolutely fine. And then suddenly something will wallop me, my fatigue levels all absolutely spiral. And it's probably because I ignore it completely. And as an athlete, you're always, tra you're always training in that red zone or trying to. Um, but you, you try to ignore your body and then smash, crash, bang, wallop. Uh, my poor wife, my poor son, get the brunt of it. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, we, we know, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a former athlete myself. You know, I haven't competed at the level you have, but I know what it takes to compete at a high level. Um, what, you, what you went through in that early stage and the inspiration you took from your friend's mum is, is quite remarkable. Um, and as Elizabeth said, it, you know, it's incredibly inspiring. Fast forward Thank you. to 2016, you've had a really successful year before, you competed for um, GB at the, at the World Champs, didn't you, and, and did incredibly, incredibly well there, winning gold medal. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to Rio, which is the pinnacle of any athlete's career to, to reach the Olympic or the Paralympic Games. What was that like? Can you describe that for those of us that have dreamed of it that have never reached it? It is, to be fair, I, it didn't hit me until about a good three or four months afterwards when I was at the um, Spotty Awards. Um, I was on the front seat and Robbie Williams was singing. And don't get me wrong, I don't like Robbie Williams as a singer. He, he's done an all right. I reckon I can sing better. Probably not, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I um, was on the front row and, so, and it was the song that he sung. I couldn't even tell you what it's called, but I'd know it if I heard it. And I have got it on my playlist somewhere. But it suddenly made me realise what I had achieved. Um, but when I won gold at the time, it wasn't about me. Every time I won a medal, I really struggled to actually receive the medal on um, podium. I, I really, I kind of, I was a bit of a shrinking violet, I guess. And I still am. I don't like it. If I had my way, I would pick myself out a little, um, what are they called, mascot, and have my, my face on their face. Yeah. And they could go and receive the medal for me. That would be my dream. Um, but unfortunately, we're not allowed. Apparently, we have to be up there for one reason or another. I don't get it. Um, so I actually use Rio as a platform really to raise awareness and also inspire and uh, inspire is kind of a corny word, I guess, because everyone uses it, but it is the only word you can really find at the time because it is what it does. It captivates people and you're inspiring them all the way. And I selected different people for my races to dedicate my race to. And then when I'd warm up and when I was in prep, um, obviously prep, I'd quickly pop on my social media. We wouldn't look at social media to put us off, but I'd go on, I'd make a little dedication to that person the night before and then after my race. And then on the day I would cycle with their, with their face in front of me, literally in front of me on a like tape to something. And they would be my motivation. That's incredible. Um, and 
Well, my gold medal winning ride, so I was the first gold medalist of Rio 2016, which is, is a phenomenal achievement itself. And I remember being interviewed by Sky and saying, hold on to that, first gold medal, no one else will ever get that. And I remember cringing, but it is true, it is the first gold medal. So there's a little bit of me that is super proud of myself, and another bit of me that dies inside for even being super proud of myself. Well, the whole nation is super proud of you, Megan, the whole <laughs> nation, so you're allowed to be. <laughs> but anyway, I dedicated to this young lad, Alistair Rowan, um, and he basically, he, he lived in, near Coventry, and he had collapsed at school and had a very similar aneurysm to myself. Um, and he had only had it a couple of months before I went out to Rio. So through... Um, through social media channels, I approached his parents and said, look, um, I understand this is this is happening to you guys at the moment. I've been through a similar circumstance, but I'm going to be racing in Rio and I would like to dedicate that ride to Alistair. Wow. Um, wow. And they got back to me and I said, yeah, that'd be amazing. And um, what, I, what I thought was amazing is when you're in Rio, you're in your little Paralympic bubble, your little athlete bubble. Everyone there is about what they can do, not what they can't do. And everyone's got a different impairment, um, something else to fight with. But everyone handles it differently, handles it in their own way. Yeah. But you're all an athlete. You're all what, about what you can do. Yeah. So I didn't realise that when I won my gold medal, and then I went round and did the um, like fan zone media stuff. I never remember what it's called. I'm such a rubbish professional athlete. It's unbelievable. Um, and did my interviews and I did my dedication and I made sure that that was my focus because you only get a couple of minutes, minutes t airtime on, on yeah. newspapers. So if you're going to do it, focus on what you want to focus on ASAP. Um, so you don't lose that opportunity. And that's what I did. Um, and I didn't realise that at home it had gone viral and the amount of support and the amount of um, hype it had brought back home for this young lad and his family was amazing. You know, it gave them a different focus. Because obviously as parents as well to a young lad, I think he was 10 at the time, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nerve wracking. And to be able to try and give them some kind of hope or something positive to work towards was amazing in itself. And they Alistair must have been was- so grateful. Uh, they must have been so grateful for you to, you know, dedicate that that gold medal winning uh, ride, and then ultimately the, the gold medal itself to, you know, to their son. They must they must have been overwhelmed by that. Yeah, I, I don't honestly, I don't under, I don't know how exactly they felt, but I know that we keep in contact, Good. and I know that it must have meant something. Yeah. Um, and I know that Alistair is doing amazingly well. You know, he's Good. a he's a young, almost like he, uh, I think he's a young ambassador himself actually, and he does a lot of work for his school and gives out awards and stuff. And he, he's you really used it to to benefit his life and also do good for others. And it's amazing to see that and to watch him grow. Like, have you convinced I've him to, actually, to get on a bike? Not yet. He he was into football, and I'm pretty sure he still is. He he's very sporty. But I am I have every intention of going to play badminton with him. Still haven't done it. Bless him. Um, so by the time I meet him, he'll probably be an adult, which it isn't the aim. Um, but the moment I get a chance, I will. I must go and visit him. Um, I do try. I always try and keep in contact with everyone that I I make dedications to as well. Yeah, so. no, brilliant. So, so you've had an incredible career post uh, or leading through Rio and then post Rio. And then obviously uh, COVID-19 has hit. Uh, you're in prep and training uh, with the home of going out to Tokyo. Yeah, Tokyo this year for, for another uh, Paralympic Games. So that must, you know, when you're told that the, uh, the Paralympic Games are being postponed for next year and you've worked tirelessly on another four-year cycle to try and get your body in peak uh, physical condition, ready to then make the, 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 the GB team and then go out and represent Paralympics uh, GP in, in Tokyo. To be told that it's been delayed for you, it must have an effect on your kind of psyche and your mental health. Then you take into account your kind of your background, uh, Megan, and your upbringing, and then you go in for a stroke itself. How do you deal with your own kind of mental demons and your own mental health? And then when you take into account lockdown as well, which we know a lot of stroke survivors are really, really suffering with depression, heightened levels of anxiety. How do you look after your mental well-being? And therefore, and from that, how can you offer advice and guidance to people like me and, you know, your other fellow stroke survivors? Well, I'll keep my house clean first and foremost. <laughs> as I'm around it 24-7, it drives me insane. <laughs> um... But no, to be fair, when we were told that Tokyo was postponed, it was obviously on the horizon. Yeah. Um, 
and it, it is a shock and I think for some, every athlete would have dealt with it in a different way and some would have been like this is my final games and I really need you know I'm hitting peak now I really I'm ready but and to have it delayed is hard work yep. for me if anything it's kind of benefited me in a weird kind of way but okay. uh, but it has had a negative impact so it's given me longer to prepare because I know that I've been struggling massively the last couple of years so a couple of years ago in a road race I was in um yeah, I was in a pileup basically. I'd gone over. I was at the back of the. Um, I was at the back, and I went straight over all the bikes. Um, and I basically, I broke my elbow. Um, I oh. damaged my ligament. And I had when I, as I literally flew back the following day. Um, it was my son's birthday, sixteenth birthday as well, actually. So it's quite an important birthday for him. And we were in hospital. Um, being viewed and checked and blah 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 but ultimately ever since then i've never really been able to get my fitness right back to where it was yeah. um and i've really struggled with that and maybe part of that is age maybe part of that's age maybe part of that is because actually i've won the gold medal and now i'm moving on to other things i'm not sure i can't quite work it out but i've always i have struggled with my mental health massively so i have ocd and i do suffer with depression but i'm aware of it and it's about really keeping Building on your toolbox and being aware of it and actually asking for help. Sometimes we we don't ask for help and that's when it goes wrong. Because if you don't ask for help, um, you secretly go down bit by bit. And, and as an athlete as well, you're worried that if you ask for help, is this going to affect your athlete career? Are they going to start thinking you're not ready? You're not able to cope with the demands on it. And as a power athlete as well, my body changes like the wind. So if I'm depressed or if I'm really struggling with my mental health, my, my body starts to shut down as well. So my right side doesn't work as effectively. My speech yeah. starts to struggle. Yeah. Um, my home life struggles, you know, my poor partner um, and my son, you know, when I'm on a bad day, it must be awful for them. You know, a lot of, I have had Tony come and, pick me up, drag me upstairs, literally have to drag me up because my body's not working and tuck me into bed because I refuse to go to bed, but actually I need it. Yep. So sometimes I think having that support now has um, really helped in that respect, but I've got to listen a little bit more and it makes me aware of the impact I have on other people as well because sometimes you can get so self-absorbed in yourself and you don't mean to, you don't even see it sometimes yep. and you suddenly realise the damage you're doing around you and that makes me feel in terribly terribly almost guilt-ridden because I don't want to be like that and I don't see myself as that kind of person. Yeah. Um, but for me, cycling was my biggest help or sport activity in general is my biggest focus to help me um, get back on it, get back to it. And not for winning a gold medal because for me, I'm not sure about other athletes. Like obviously when you're on the start line or you're ready to race or ready to do whatever it is you do, if you're in a competition, you want to win the goals. You don't want to be second you don't want to be third you don't want to be last yeah but you know even last night i was on a zwift zwift session i was fourth out of 214 my son accidentally came around the back of my turbo trainer knocked the wire out and then all of a sudden i am last and the last 20 minutes i had to cycle by myself and try and find the determination to carry on and i really didn't want to but i did i did just about Good. manage it um but at the time i was i was seething I was like, no, I'm doing so well here. And the chances are I'm the only disabled person here. <laughs> Not that I see myself disabled at all. <laughs> Unless it suits, of course. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's been a hard couple of years, really. So for me, it gave me a breather because I've got a lot of personal things going on in my home life that I need to sort out as well. Um, family member illnesses, things like that. Um, and as everyone's life is, it can be really hectic. So it gave me almost a, brief, a bit of breathing time just to get back on top of things, decide what it is that I want to do, refocus yeah. and get back on the bike. And it's allowed me that breathing space. But yes. now I am getting itchy pants. I'm getting itchy feet. And I do need to be out racing to get that bug again. Um, I am very fortunate that I, I can ride at home and I have the access to facilities. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, uh, access to equipment, which I wouldn't have had if I wasn't on the GB team. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, but for me, the big thing is, is if I don't exercise, my, my mental health deteriorates straight away. Yeah. And I'm not saying that someone should pick up a bike because they need to get out. You know, the sunshine makes a massive difference. You know, if, if it was raining while lockdown was going on, I bet every single one of us here now listening to this would be, or well, probably wouldn't even be listening to it because we couldn't be bothered. We'd be too depressed. Yeah. No, you're <laughs> you right. Know, the sun makes a massive difference. 
it does. It does. And, you know, it, it, at the stroke of like, you know what we're all about. It's all about, um, you know, focusing on the niche of supporting survivors in their activity choices post-stroke, really, and engaging in exercise to support physical, mental and emotional well-being. That's why we set yeah. the charity up. But if we focus on the kind of mental well-being um, with Mental Health Awareness Week, you know, last week, we focus on, you know, there, there are kind of five things that people should be doing. Eating well, sleeping well, getting fresh air, exercising and being kind to themselves. So what we mean yeah. by being kind to yourself is when you look in the mirror, make sure you're being kind to the person that's looking back at you. Don't keep beating yourself up because if you do, all you're going to do is spiral back into, you know, a negative yeah. viewpoint and depression. So try and get fresh air every day. If you haven't got the physical capacity to get out and about, get a window open, breathe in some oxygen, eat as well and as varied as balanced diets as you can because get the nutrients on board um, and you will feel better about yourself. And it's just trying to look after yourself in every way you possibly can because that will all support your physical, mental and emotional well-being. And taking it to the extreme level, you've got someone like yourself who's been through you know, the depths that you have in 2013 that's really picked themselves up you know, faced adversity, challenged yourself to become the athlete that you have, ultimately with that goal of achieving what your friend's mum asked you to do is dedication to something. And your dedication and perseverance and your resilience enabled you to pick up a gold medal for Great Britain. And as you said, the very first gold medal of the 2016 Rio Paralympic Games, which is, which is incredible. If okay with you, Megan, we've got um, a question come in from um, mm -hmm. Sim, and I know Sim. Sim, Sim launched uh, a charity um, a little bit before A Stroke of Luck was launched, uh, the Cabanova Society, and she's an incredible uh, lady herself. So she's asked a question saying, I really struggle with cleats post-stroke due to her balance. However, without them, I'm not being as efficient. Have you got any tips on how to work on getting comfortable with cleats? I'll leave that one to you, Megan, to... Um, <laughs> Well, to, be, to be fair, um, I really struggled post-stroke. Um, Pre-stroke, I didn't ride a bike, so I didn't really know anything. But for balance and coordination side of it, it was a massive issue. Um, obviously, we need the cleats to help us pull that pedal, pedal back round. I don't feel the pull, but I know that it keeps my foot on that pedal, and I know it does make a massive difference to my power output. Um, to get used to it, I use a turbo trainer, so the bike is static, but just so I could practice being able to get, get one foot out and one foot back in. Now, depending on your weakness, whether it's on your right side or left side, depends which foot you keep clipped in. So mine is on my right side, so my right foot is always clipped in. I don't unclip it until I'm getting off the bike, and I use the bike as almost like my, my walking aid afterwards when I'm really fatigued, so heels so screws me over straight away. Not just because I, I pass myself as the beast athlete on the team, but because I am just not a racing snake when it comes to heels. I see them and my bike stops before I even get there. <laughs> so by the time I get to the top of the hill, I can barely unclip my foot to stop and be able to dismount to un... I can't even talk now, to jump off safely, basically. Um, so I just keep pedaling for my dear life. Um, it is a practice thing. It does take time, but it's all about those fine motor skills and really, really being confident, confident with yourself at it. So start yeah. on static, on a bike. When you get to that stage, then go out. It start with quiet roads where you're not going to get distracted because for me, distractions is a massive thing. I use headphones a lot and I know they say you shouldn't for traffic purposes, but actually it's safer for me. If I don't wear headphones and I just hear cars suddenly whiz past me, I, my body goes into tone and starts jumping and kind of spazzing out. I'm not sure whether that's totally correct word, but that's what I call it anyway. Um, but with the headphones in, as long as there's a bit of volume, I know that it's coming, but my body can almost cope with that that change yeah. in environment a lot a lot easier and then i can focus on what i need to focus on it is a time thing um but if if local i'm always more than happy to go out for a ride and practice and do a few little bits and bobs and training bits to do with that um also with your cleats is make sure it's set on the easiest setting to get it in and out to start off with and then walking on them start with walking with the bike and it's it's just weight transfer and your and how you balance yourself in order to walk in them I know we're not meant to walk in them, but unfortunately, if we need to get into the shop for a drink or something, we're going to have to. And the amount of times I have nearly slipped and broken my neck doing it is, yeah, I can't count them on my fingers. <laughs> <All toes. laughs> well, Sims, Sims just thank you, uh, Megan, for that advice. We've got another 
question come in here. Um, saying, I've recently bought a bike. I'm a, a bit off going out on long rides because of riding on road safety, having already fallen off. Any tips to gain a bit of confidence out on the roads? Yeah, I think the first thing is, is start off maybe with someone else cycling with you, maybe to one side of you so that you feel like you haven't got the traffic against you, um, as long as they're a confident rider anyway, um, so that it doesn't make you any any worse. Um, and then also, start with quieter roads before you hit the main roads. And it's a matter of just doing it sometimes. And it is it just takes time. And again, like I said about um, headphones, sometimes it's nice just to have a bit of music in so that you don't realise how fast that traffic is sometimes and how close they pass you. You've got to focus on you, focus on what's in front of you. And as long as you're watching the hazards and doing what you can, you will be okay. It just takes time and, and the confidence will come. Brilliant. Well, Megan, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, speaking with you and I'm and I think I say this on behalf of everybody that's been watching this and everybody you know these, these are recorded so anybody that, that downloads this and watches this in the future um, thank you for for everything you're doing you're a you know you're an ambassador to a stroke of luck I know you do a lot of work as well with other charities as well in the stroke space and and outside the stroke space um, for somebody that's that's gone through what you've done and the amount of time that you dedicate to to supporting others is is quite remarkable. So, you know, from me, thank you so so much and incredibly well done on what you've achieved so far. And you've got everyone at a stroke of luck supporting you and everyone across the whole of Great Britain supporting you in your pursuit to Tokyo 2021. And I know you and I will stay very close you know, as we do, uh, but just, I'm absolutely certain everybody will now be following your journey even more closely and hoping, you know, hoping that we see you top of that podium in Tokyo. But thanks ever so much for joining us tonight, Megan. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Have a super weekend, enjoy the sun um, and get training. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say also, it's, it's just lovely to be in the stroke environment, really, and have people that can relate. You know, we're all people at the end of the day. And also, you know, I always welcome messages if someone does have a, have a, have a question or even advice about something non-cycling related, just to share a story about a stroke and how they've got over something. It, you know, everyone has amazing bits to contribute to this. So thank you. So, so, so just to put it out there, uh, Megan, you've got obviously an Instagram page, you've got a Facebook page as well. So if people want yeah. to get Twitter, in touch, will they just ping you a message? Yeah, ping a message and either way, it will get to me somehow. It's not Brilliant. a problem. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much. Have a great evening no worries. and I'll speak to you Catch soon. Catch you later. Catch Take you later, care, people. Megan. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Wow. Uh, what an incredible uh, individual Megan is, both as a, as a person, uh, for what she's been through, how resilient she is, but equally as an athlete as well. Um, as most of you know, you know, I, I was a former swimmer. Um, I aspired to, to reach the levels uh, that Megan has, so I can only look in awe um, at what she's achieved. And, and to do that through the adversity that she's faced is, 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 is remarkable. Okay, next week's uh, guest on the Friday Live session um, is a lady called Sarah Belson. Sarah works for the World Stroke Organization. And as you may know, A Stroke of Luck is one of the stroke support organizations uh, that work with the World Stroke Organization. And next week, we're going to be talking about the work that, that they do. And also the fact that A Stroke of Luck has been asked, um, and I'm very excited by this, has been asked to be an integral part to this year's World Stroke Campaign. The World Stroke Day, as we all know, is the, um, is the 29th of October. Um, a stroke of luck, because you know our focus is absolutely on exercise and activity, support, as I, as I keep saying, physical, mental and emotional well-being. We've been asked to take the lead, or part of the lead, around a uh, World Stroke Campaign. So can't wait to have a conversation with Sarah about that. As I mentioned um, at the start of this live session, we are not a government-funded uh, charity. So if you are enjoying the live sessions, if you're enjoying the content that we're creating and you have uh, a few pence or a few pounds, a few cents or a few dollars that you can spare, please do click on the link in the bio, click the donate button and as donate and donate to us as much as you can afford. It's all greatly appreciated. But for now, thank you so much for uh, joining this Friday live session with the Stroke of Luck. I look forward to seeing you all again next Friday. Have a great evening and a lovely weekend. Okay. Bye for now.